Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Rancho Cordova City Council for the um, 3rd of December. Uh, hard to believe it's December already, but welcome. Um, we, want to, uh, we want to let you know that um, we also um, treasure the memory of our late president, George H.W. Bush, and we are providing um, a uh, sort of a guest registry book in the back of the room that will, um, will ultimately be sent to the presidential library. So if anybody has, um, has an opportunity and would like to leave some sort of a memory of the president or that point in time, or if anybody was a point of light, then um, you're perfectly welcome to do that. So Stacy, we'll ask you to call the roll. Council Member Terry? Here. Council Member Gatewood? Here. Council Member Sander? Here. Vice Mayor McGarvey? Here. Mayor Budge? Here. Thank you very much. Um, we also um, want to welcome the people who will be viewing us on cable or the internet or whatever. And we'll ask Stacy to read the playback schedule. The meeting of the Rancho Cordova City Council will be cable cast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air on Wednesday, December 5th at 9 a.m. and Sunday, December 9th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. A DVD copy of this meeting is available for checkout from any library branch. A copy can also be ordered from the city clerk's department and a webcast of this meeting will also be available on the city's website within 48 hours of adjournment of this meeting. Thank you. Um, we always begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance and with an invocation. Tonight's invocation will be brought to us by Pastor Phil Cooley from Cordova Neighborhood Church. And hang on. And uh, our Pledge of Allegiance first will be led by Mike Speich, uh, retired Rancho Cordova firefighter. And so if you'll all stand and then remain standing, you are invited to for the invocation. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <coughs> Council, staff, uh, public, thank you for giving me the opportunity to pray over this meeting. Let us do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this council, Lord, and their willingness to lead our community. We pray that you will bless them, that you will give them the wisdom that is necessary to lead well. You will give them the ability that they need, Father. I pray in this season of holiday that you would give them rest as they have opportunity to take a break. And Lord, I lift up their family and their friends who also work hard as they are here. Would you bless them, Father? We give this meeting to you. We pray that the business that needs to be accomplished is done so well. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And if anybody hasn't made the obvious connection, Anybody who's new to Rancho Cordova, Philip, of course, is a longtime resident whose dad was our colleague and is now serving us well in the assembly. So thank you. It's great to see you. We're going to go into uh, presentations, and we're going to begin with um, uh, our Community Enhancement Fund presentations. So we'll turn it over to Stacy Delaney. While Stacy's coming up, uh, let me remind everybody that um, we do have speaker cards in the back of the room. And of course, there is an opportunity for public comment. And so um, for anybody who hasn't yet uh, signed up and handed their speaker card to Stacy Leitner, you're welcome to do that at this point. Stacy. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Stacy Delaney, the Community Enhancement Analyst for the City. This evening, we will be presenting ceremonial checks to several organizations that were approved for grant funding through the city's Community Enhancement Fund. These projects and programs support local Rancho Cordova priorities, including education, entertainment, civic engagement, quality of life, 
and many others, while continuing to make our city a safe and inviting place to live, work, and have fun. Mayor and council members, please come down and join these groups as they receive their ceremonial checks. So the first check being presented this evening is for River City Christian to organize and operate their crossover basketball league. The crossover basketball league invites students in Rancho Cordova to participate in a co-ed league that will run from late January 2019 through May 2019. This pro program benefits residents by providing increased opportunities for students to engage in sports, learn teamwork, and develop leadership skills. Fred Hammer and Danny Lincoln are the ones accepting the check for $13,000. The second check this evening is for the Mills One Club to fund the repairs and update the safety features on the historic Mills One fire engine. This will preserve a local historical resource that is used in parades, on display, in historical celebrations, and other events here in Rancho Cordova. Michael Speich and Doug Leard are accepting the check for $15,000. <laughs> <laughs> The third check this evening is for Symphony de Oro for the purpose of funding equipment and other expenses, which will enhance their ability to provide musical offerings in the city. Symphony de Oro enhances both the residents' experience as well as visitors, and we can enjoy high quality music and further the city's goal of becoming an arts destination. Like exactly. Lorraine Crozier is accepting the check for $19,280. The fourth check this evening is for Cordova Lancers Leaders and Legends for the continuation of the mentors at Cordova High program. The program provides mentoring services and group activities to students in Rancho Cordova to help them improve academic performance, gain skills to overcome challenges, and engage in community service projects. Conrad Mayer, as well as mentors and mentees from the program, are accepting the check for $60,000. I'm doing a little rearranging. Okay. I think it's okay. 
So the fifth and final check this evening is for Folsom Cordova Unified School District and it's funding two different programs, the after school education and safety program as well as the family engagement summer academy that will take place in 2019. Both of these programs provide enhanced educational opportunities for students and the summer program also provides opportunities for student parents as well as guardians to participate as well. <laughs> Linda Burkholder is accepting the check for $60,000. So I'm gonna take her check temporarily, and then Linda's gonna stay up here because she's gonna receive a proclamation as well. Yeah, come on over here. I don't like holding a mic and doing this, so this makes my life easier. Okay. So we have this proclamation here given in recognition of Linda Burkholder on December 3rd, 2018. Whereas Fols Cordova Director of Family Engagement and Support Services, Linda Burkholder, received an inspirational leadership award from the California, California Department of Education for her commitment and contributions to expanded learning programs. Linda oversees the Family Engagement and Support Services for Fols Cordova Unified School District, which helps children, students, families be successful by connecting them with needed services resources uh, and resources. This includes information and referral services, the Summer Academy, the Safety Center at Cordova Lane, and the After School Education and Safety Program. And for almost two decades, Linda has supported the dedicated staff members of the After School Education and Safety ACES Program. The program serves more than 500 students at school sites in Ranch Cordova. Linda also directs the school district's Family Engagement Summer Academy, which offers at no cost locally funded four week STEM enrichment programs for elementary students. Parents are also allowed to enroll as co-learners alongside their children. Both the ACEs and Summer Academy programs are supported in part by the Community Enhancement Fund, which you just saw the check for. <laughs> Linda Burkholder was, pre was presented with the Inspirational Leadership Award on October 25th, uh, 2018 by State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson at the California Department of Education headquarters in Sacramento. And the Inspirational Leadership Award recognizes individuals that have made a significant contribution to the California expanded learning field. California's expanding, expanded learning programs are an integral part of young people's education, engaging them in year-round learning opportunities that prepare them for college, career, and life. This year, Linda was selected by her fellow school district administrators as Fols Cordova Unified School District Administrator of the Year. Now therefore, now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Ranch Cordova does hereby recognize Linda Burkholder for her outstanding leadership skills and contributions to the ACES program and the Family Engagement Summer Academy. And our mayor has uh, signed it and put her seal of approval on here. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I think we're going to come right over here. Okay, well, this one's bittersweet for me because I'm going to miss this person deeply. Rebecca. <laughs> this is Rebecca Garrison. Bittersweet for me, too. <laughs> Whereas the city of Rancho Cordova recognizes Rebecca Garrison of the 50 Carter Transportation Management Association, the TMA, serving since October 1999. Where did the time go? Whereas the 50 Carter TMA is a private public nonprofit association which works to improve mobility along the 50 Carter, Highway 50 Carter in the unincorporated areas of Sacramento, El Dorado counties, Folsom, and the city of Rancho Cordova. And whereas Rebecca Garrison is retiring after 18 years of successful leadership as executive director of the TMA. <laughs> 
don't do that, please. Don't do that. Whereas, during those years, Rebecca Garrison communicated with TMA board members, 50 corridor commuters, commute coordinators, special committees, task forces, elected officials, and staff to reduce traffic, improve air quality, and improve the quality of life in the region, and had everybody in the palm of her hand. Anybody who knows her knows that. And whereas Rebecca Garrison has worked with the city to achieve bicycle-friendly community status by providing bicycle education for adults and students, fostered a successful bike to school program at two city schools and promoted special bicycle events to city residents, especially during May is, during May is Bike Month and, um, and organized or participated in this enormous ride from Discovery Park all the way into the state capitol, which is an absolute highlight of May is Bike Month. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Rancho Cordova does hereby re recognize Rebecca for her commitment to the community, leadership of the TMA, and dedication in making Rancho Cordova a better place to live, work, and play. And we're going to miss you. We know Mom will be thrilled. <laughs> She's going to South Mississippi. <laughs> and I'm going to miss you guys so much. Thank you. Would you like to? Anything? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would just like to say thank you, and I really will miss you guys. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> Can I say Paris. something? As testament to, to Linda's comment about in the palm of your hand, <laughs> that I had to mix smoothies <laughs> four bicycle. times That's in right. a year That's right. with a bicycle <laughs> that had a blender <laughs> attached to the back tire. <laughs> and I had to make smoothies for kids that walked and biked to school. I and, and do a very embarrassing commercial, but I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so thank you for all your service. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. Thank Rusty, you. Rusty. And thank you for your service. Your we could go on a while with the things we've had to do. Rusty <laughs> Dupre and I and Steve Miklos had to do a bicycle race from the base of the Folsom <laughs> Bluffs up to their city park. Oh my God. Ooh, uphill. Uphill Ooh. the whole way, three Ooh. three of us. She was smart not to ask me to do that. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was brutal. I have I've done a lot of cycling. I've never done anything as hard as that. I did. Because I, I was I, 20 years ago. lose. Ranch Cordova was not going to lose that. We didn't by far. We didn't. I nearly lost my life, but we did not lose. <laughs> <laughs> and numerous other adventures. Yeah. Yes, you all were good, were good sports. Yeah, all thank you. <laughs> thank you again. Love you. Love you. Are you sure? Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, we are presenting a special proclamation tonight to a developer member of our Rancho Cordova business community. And prior to giving the proclamation, we wanted to provide some background and also some visuals because uh, it's a really unique honor that we're recognizing. Uh, tonight, we have with us uh, representatives of Basin Street Properties, which is a prominent Northern California and Northern Nevada real estate investor and developer. In January 22nd of this year, as you can see denoted on the slide, uh, Basin Street acquired our Prospect Green Campus, which is located uh, here right across the street from City Hall. It is a five building 518,000 square foot, 33 acre campus, and very important to our Rancho Cordova business community. Uh, immediately upon acquiring the campus, they set out to make some very cool improvements. And that's what we wanted to show you this evening. Uh, so, so far in the 11 short months of owning the property, they have instituted bike sharing, created a volleyball court, enhanced their walking paths, which is one of my favorite parts. Um, it looks like it should be one of the smallest on the slide, but it's really fun, and I encourage everyone to take a walk over there because as you walk along the walking path, 
Uh, they have markers along the path to compare the laps around the campus to different uh, landmarks around the world, including the Space Needle, uh, the Eiffel Tower, etc. So it's really cool and it adds a really unique personality to the campus. In addition, they have uh, installed new picnic areas with really cool uh, modern seating. They've enhanced their cafe with a really great patio and expanded their fitness center, which as you can see in the photo rivals any uh, hotel or gym fitness center. Uh, the White Rock campus, it was initially designed and developed by David Taylor as a campus for E-Trade, a little bit of Rancho Cordova history, and now it houses some of our largest employers, including uh, NEC, uh, Liberty Mutual, and others. So we'd like to take a moment to honor them this evening because uh, enhancing our office core is one of our primary economic development initiatives. As we all know, uh, we're the region's primary employment subcenter with 75,000 employees. This area in particular is very important to us. The area that this campus sits within one square mile houses over 20,000 employees. So every improvement that we make there has maximum impact. So tonight we are saying thank you. I would like to invite up Frank Marinello, VP of Development Development with Basin Street, as well as Elaine Nelson, Regional Manager with Basin Street, to accept the proclamation and uh, hopefully say a few words. On behalf of the City Council, I'm happy to present a proclamation which has been duly signed, witnessed, and sealed by our mayor. So congratulations for Thank your great you work. Much. We appreciate it. We look forward to Thank many you. years of partnership with you in the community. We take each now we've only very seriously, and we're happy you do the same with your property. So if you'd like to say a few words, that'd be great. I'll make it very brief. Thank you very much for inviting us to your community. And um, we are going to do everything we can to retain those tenants uh, that were mentioned <laughs> and attract new tenants uh, as well to some of our vacant space, which is dwindling very quickly, uh, I think, in uh, large part due to the, the projects that we've uh, implemented at, uh, at the property. But less about us and more about, on behalf of all of Basin Street, how important and how nice it is to hear it from you about these, these improvements that we're making. So it says a lot about what you think about the business community. It makes us want to uh, acquire additional property and do great things and work with you all and, and hopefully be a partner uh, with you going into the future. So thank you very much uh, for the recognition and we really appreciate it. Well, we hope we're, you're successful in that goal. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Super. Okay, so now we're going to turn it over to Albert Stricker. Good evening, Mayor Budge and council members. Albert Stricker with the Public Works Department. <laughs> and the city this year has successfully completed over $20 million of in infrastructure projects. And we're on course to deliver another $20 million in infrastructure projects next year. In order to manage a program like that, we need a really strong leader. And I'm really pleased to present to you this evening Edgar Medina, who is a new senior engineer that is, who is joining our team. He's very seasoned and um, experienced individual, has experience at small agencies, um, public and private, both in California and outside of California. A very talented new engineer that I'm pleased to announce has joined our team in the last month, has come up to speed extremely quickly and very impressively, and um, we expect a lot of great things with his leadership on our team. Super. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, um, City Manager. I'm happy to be here. I'm very excited to help uh, deliver quite a dynamic uh, capital improvement program and exciting projects for the city. Uh, as Albert, uh, Director Albert Stricker mentioned, I do have a, uh, a lot of experience with small and very big uh, 
uh, municipality. So I'm excited to be here and, and help deliver the next round of projects. Well, we appreciate that, Edgar. Um, there are several people in the audience tonight for whom infrastructure is their favorite topic, and they're, uh, they're going to be pleased to, to meet you. And I'm sure they're all going to want to shake your hand and tell you exactly what you should be working on. You, yeah, you might. <laughs> they're right over there. And if you've already gotten your business cards, I would just give it to them now. <laughs> well, I'll be happy to talk to them. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Maria Neistead with the Community Communications and Public Affairs Department. I am here this evening to introduce a new member of our team who will be working in the Community Engagement Division with Lorianne Ulm and helping her to expand that important program here in the city of Rancho Cordova. I'd like to introduce Matt Buland. He will be the Community Engagement Assistant in the Community Engagement Division. Matt grew up in the Sacramento region and has always had a passion for the environment um, and as well as community engagement. Over the last eight years, he has worked with the Sacramento Tree Foundation, connecting trees and their many benefits with communities in the region, including right here in Rancho Cordova. In fact, over the last year, he has worked directly with the city to bring our trees program to this community. Uh, we'd like to welcome Matt. We're very excited to be bringing on someone who has such a strong foundation in community engagement. We're very excited to work with him, and I'm going to turn it over and uh, let him have a, a few words. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've been kind of on a long journey, um, and trees are really kind of what brought me here. Um, but over that time, I've really found a passion for connecting with communities and really kind of improving and building um, that, you know, what's really important um, for cities and communities. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to, uh, to join you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'm looking forward to get, getting going. So thank you. Welcome, Matt. And, and as we just told Edgar, um, all the same people who are here tonight are also some of our most engaged residents, as you probably know already. So again, if you have business cards and they don't have them already, then you're probably going to want to hand them out. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you, everybody. We are now at the point of public comment. Um, I know Stacy has speaker cards. Uh, citizens wishing to address the council on any matter that is not on the agenda have that opportunity at this point. And we would ask that you take uh, three minutes and, and tell us what's on your minds. And um, remember, please, that items that are not on the agenda can't really be discussed tonight, but we will either find you a staff person to assist or schedule something that needs to be, um, needs further work, schedule that for a future agenda item. So Stacy, who are our speakers tonight? I have four speaker cards so far. The first one is Pamela Bradley. If you would please come forward and introduce yourself. Following Pamela will be Daryl Langwell. Hi, good evening, Major, um, Mayor Budge and City Council members. Um, my name is Pam Bradley, and I'm a volunteer with HART, the Homeless Assistance Resource Team. And tonight, I just wanted to give you a brief update of where we're at um, in our upcoming shelter. So the winter shelter is scheduled to begin on Friday, December 30th, and our hope is to provide shelter through the month of March. So far, we have the first five weeks covered, and we have uh, two weeks in February and one week in March. But we are still in need of four more churches to help us with this um, effort during our shelter season. We've been actively recruiting since last summer, um, recruiting pastors of churches here in Rancho Cordova to assist with this need. And in some cases, we're still waiting for a response. Um, I also would like to invite each one of you to come either to our intake site or come to one of our um, shelters, um, one of the churches to have dinner and meet some of your constituents that are, um, because of life circumstances, are facing homelessness. 
Further, I just wanted to mention that because of the rising cost of rent, some families are being displaced from their homes. And this trend continues, and as it does, we are gonna to continue to see more homeless in Rancho Cordova. So my question for you all at City Council is, what are your plans to help solve this issue? Uh, what can be done about having more affordable housing in our community? And what kind of transitional housing can be provided for those who are ready and willing to climb out of the plight of homelessness? So I thank you for your consideration and concern about these, um, this serious issue and, the, and how this affects all of our community. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Next speaker is Darrell. Uh, good evening, Mayor Budge and council members. Uh, I'm very concerned about what I saw earlier this evening. In this country, we're supposed to have a separation of church and state, and I watched the city present a church with monies collected through taxation. The council can color this any way they wish, but in my view, this is a in direct contradiction to the separation doc doctrine. Thank you, Gerald. Um, Adam, would you like to talk with him later? Okay. Thank you. Next. Next speaker card is Stan Jones, and following Stan will be Mary Nessel. I was puttering around the house, so that's why I don't have a tie on. I suddenly realized it was already 5.30. So, I know that we're aware of this, um, this path uh, called Grant Line Road, which will be some connector between south of the city to east of the city, connecting Highway 99 to um, US 50. And I would like to, I know that I'm not gonna say anything, I'll just be extremely brief because I'm not saying anything you don't already know, and I'm sure it's in the county plan as well as the city's plan, but I would encourage us not to lose the vision of limited access to this feeder, because if you need, ex if you need examples of this, Highway uh, 84 that connect in San Jose and Santa Clara County, connecting Highway 101 to 280 is a wonderful road. It has limited access. I drove on it two weeks ago. And um, in Santa Clara County, I don't know the I have examples out here, but there are things called expressways and parkways, streets. They elevate them a little bit in Santa Clara County, but they're limited access, like one exit per mile and so forth. The idea being to keep traffic flowing. And I'm sure that we want in our traffic plans to be able to have that traffic plan between 50 and 99, although sometimes we can let little things interfere with that, uh, allowing a little bit. I noticed the proper individual properties wanting adjacent to Grant Line Road. And so if every property there has a direct access onto Grant Line Road, you lose that feature. So that's my comment there. Also, in the obituaries, I don't know if you're aware, back, you, Mayor Budge is acknowledging, um, before we were a city and in our first election when we were voted and we voted in council members, uh, one of the people, there was about somewhere around 15 uh, people who actually uh, ran in that election. 21. 21, <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. So in the obituaries today, um, yesterday was one of those candidates, Aubrey Stone, who is African American, he was, uh, he served as um, chair or CEO of the Black California Chamber of Black Chamber of Commerce. His wife also worked with uh, feeding programs for youth in uh, ranch, including in in the area of Rancho Cordova. So I mentioned that in in because he was a a person who was part of our history, active in promoting a community. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for reminding us, Dan. Mary Nessel. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Mary Nessel. I live in Cordova Meadows. I just noticed this evening when I got here and read the agenda about the um, tax dollars, Measure H funds that were used for River City Christian Church. 
I feel the same as Daryl does, that our taxes should not be used for any kind of church activities. And to make it, in my opinion, 10 times worse is that the conflict of interest associated with that because it's a church that one of our council members belongs to. And we've spoken at this council meeting before when there was some um, discussion about donations for an Easter egg hunt for that particular church that we should not be donating our tax dollars to a church. And I think it's completely improper and I'm very, very upset that it happened. Thank you, Mary. Anybody else? I do not have any other speaker cards at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are going to move into council reports. Donald. Well, I was going to end with this, but I'll start with it. Um, thank you for recognizing Mr. Stone. Um, my experience with him was long before I was ever on this council. Uh, but then even when I ran the first time, uh, we did a lot of phone banking out of his office, and, and he lent us space and, and, and other support. But I consider him a friend and a mentor and worked with him a lot in my last, not my last job, job before that, um, in coordinating my company's participation in their annual conference and a lot of other things. He was a, a great guy and a great mentor of mine. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to adjourn in his memory. Um, that being said, um, there's some things coming along with the Air District around um, funding and, and additional unfunded mandates that have been um, basically shoved into um, the, the expectations of local districts without any funding uh, for them. And so there's going to be some probable, probable um, uh, looking at fees and some other ways of funding the, uh, the organization uh, going forward. So probably more to talk about in the first quarter of next year. But um, we had a budget meeting this past week to start looking at different options. Uh, another issue is that federal EPA funding and a lot of other things are looking like they're uh, very much in peril with this administration. Um, thank you to those who came to see me get my 40 under 40 uh, award. And congratulations, Linda, on the we were we were getting recognized all over the, all over the region um, on the same night last week, uh, but it was a great honor to be there. And, and David, actually. Oh, David was. I'm, I'm sorry, we, I wasn't there. Sorry. We have two big wheels. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing I will say is uh, Christopher Cabaldin came up to me and asked me how many people in the city were getting awards in Rancho, and I said me, and he goes, well, we have six in West Sac, so maybe oh, we need agree. to pick it up next year, so, um, but maybe some, some friendly rivalries are, uh, around there, but yeah, the first thing he came up to me, and he asked me, how many people from your city, and I said, like, that work there? No, no, it's just people that live there, because, and then he told me, I want to say they had five or six. Gosh, at our so. award ceremony, I guess there were zero from West Sacramento. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he made sure to sit down, like, front row. And every time a West Sac person came up, he would like yell very loudly, West Sac. So we need to work on it. Um, I had the opportunity along with Cyrus and a, a handful of other folks here to attend the, is it the first annual? Is that what we're gonna call it? The first neighborhood uh, engagement dinner where they got all of the neighborhoods that Lorianne's been working with together. Um, and the caterer did an amazing job. One, because there were some dietary needs and issues that, that needed to be addressed, and she did a fantastic job of putting that together. Um, but what was really moving about it, I will say, and I know there were points where Lorianne started tearing up, but even members of the, uh, of the audience, people that came there that had been working in Lincoln Village and a few other places, as they started to tell their stories, they started to tear up, talking about the experiences that they had had there. Um, and so the impact that you're making um, and our new staff that are gonna get to work on that is really, I mean, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of things I'm really proud of working on and being a part of at this city. I don't think there's anything more important than what Lorianne's doing. Um, the, the, the type of work that we're doing to empower our neighbors and our community to be leaders in their own community and to choose what they wanna work on in their community, I think is some of the most powerful things that we're doing in this city. Um, it's really interesting too, um, and hopefully Cyrus, you don't take offense by this, but I loved this story of um, Ron, he was sharing a story with, um, it was actually, it was in, it was in, uh, in Yosemite at a conference where uh, Cyrus, he's an engineer, he believes that, you know, you start, you start a road, you finish a road, and you move on, right? And I think you would ask him at one point, like, when are we done with this, right? And it's kind of like, at some point, you've got to, you know, go back and repave and do a lot of other things. Like, th this kind of work, like, it'll never be completed. It'll just keep getting better. 
Um, and it, it, it's just, it's really, really exciting to see how far you've brought it and how far you've come to think back that like when I started here and uh, I was having this conversation with Ted about like, you know, or actually, no, I think it actually started David with you when you said we had some people here from VSP and they had just, you know, rehabbed somebody's home and he goes, there should be a nonprofit that does that. And it's like, there is a nonprofit that does that. And literally a few months later, um, we get hit up by Citibank to go out to Soilborn and to see, you know, they'll commit the money if we can find people. And she couldn't believe that there was somebody that would coordinate all the, all, all she had to do was find people, right? And that was really what her role was, was just to do volunteer coordinating. And I mean, you've, you've grown so much in the, in the last few years and what you've done and the kind of impacts that you're making in our community. So thank you to you and everyone on your team. Okay, with that being said, uh, tree lighting was awesome. The setup this year was the best we've ever had it. Putting Santa in the back so that you had plenty of room for the line was great. The frozen characters were amazing. Um, I will just say this out loud. I think the fireworks show was a little bit too big and we were a little bit too close because <laughs> you, you shouldn't be able to feel the fireworks hitting you. That's that, that you want to feel it in your chest, not on your head and in your hair. Um, but besides that, it was a great event. It was the best one we've ever had. I think this was the first year that we had that tree, right? This new tree, this new electrical tree that we bought. Was this the first year that we did it or did we do it last year? No, I think this is still the this was the first. Yeah. yeah, this was the first one. Everything came off great. It was it was a, a, a really great time for my family and my father even came out for the first year. Um, and enjoyed it with the family. So it, it, was, it was a lot of fun and kudos to everybody that was involved. But if we, if we need to make the fireworks just a little bit small, I'm fine with that. Right. Garrett. All right. What hair? I'm oh, just joking. I'm sorry, that's messed up. <laughs> He's got yeah. lots of hair. It's just in a different oh, place. He's <laughs> got what? It's in a different place. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, Chris, uh, Christmas tree was amazing. Uh, frozen characters. Uh, my boys, of course, the lady was like, hey, you want to take pictures of them? I, and I have two boys. And they're like, no. And then they tried to tackle Santa, which was the best. So we got up there. I love that event. I will always love that event. It's great. Um, so I went to the SSCA Joint Powers Authority. For everyone that wants to know, it's going to improve how we build and how we're able to move uh, conservation around and be able to basically make it easier for us to build and take care of wildlife at the same time. Uh, things that I, I of note is we were able to get a million dollar grant. We're buying over 700 new acres and we already have uh, 403 acres of wetlands that we already own for that. And so, um, and we are now designing on a budget and we've got the first director. We're looking for a director of that group. So I've heard that this was an impossible task that took over 25 years. And it sounds like I got in right at the right time to put my stamp on it and then get out. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I met with Carrie and um, our uh, homeless navigator because I would love to see the city get to a functional zero. And so I'm looking at what, that's, what that entails and kind of what it means to be a functional zero city, which means that just for everyone out there, functional zero means I want to take our vet population, our homeless vet population, and be able to have enough housing for them. Even though you can't force someone into a home, you can say that if they would like to come out of the cold, that we would have that home there. Um, I went in to the capital, re uh, capital regional broadband discussion. Um, it's a lot to talk about the cable and what the industry is going to do and really reaching out to the more rural areas and as we get farther to that and what that's going to engage and then you got some cool apps that are able to test the speed. So I always find that interesting. Um, I know Anil was not here, but Anil and I, um, we've been trying to get cybersecurity and, and what kind of jobs in the cyber industry we can bring into Rancho Cordova. That's really big for me, so I gave a speech, and I basically tried to poach a bunch of businesses that happened to be at the cybersecurity since I was sitting on a, a group about that. And finally, um, the Christmas Mall was this weekend. Um, it's great to see um, a 1,000 um, vets, uh, people that come from other countries, and be able to take care of them and get them gifts and take over. And it's just amazing to see that kind of outpouring of good faith to individuals. That's all I have.
Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. David. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, along with you, we were honored to be big wheels on the uh, 50 corridor. I thought that was a, a great event. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> yes, thank you, Rebecca, who was here earlier. I was really hoping to be awarded a big wheel in the process, particularly one adult size. I understand. Oh, that would be fun. I know. I understand they exist. So, you know. There's a any, children's museum exhibit that If we need Santa's to get, listening, uh, yeah, there might be a, <laughs> or maybe a 4th of July Cyrus. parade kind of event. A large, <laughs> anyway, big wheel with where fireworks. Donald and David race. With fireworks up a hill. I, I'm, start, a I'm starting to rewrite the city's what? standard liability waiver <laughs> as we speak. Isn't there a bike company in town that builds a, a large tricycle? Uh, I don't well, know, but we do have a specialty bicycle company. We do. Yeah, you know, I think can, they make a three wheel. Done we can order up a big done. wheel, a really Same. big wheel. In any case, it was it was nice to see the city uh, honored yeah. through Linda and I. Um, probably yeah. for our longevity, along with other tra transportation roles along the year, years. Uh, I attended the uh, Symphony de Oro Christmas concert at Cordova High School on s Friday night. That was in, a, you were there as well, nice. Madam Mayor. Uh, that was an incredible concert. They, uh, they filled the place up. They filled it up with people, with music, with goodwill, with creativity. Um, there is no other concert quite like this. I would strongly, strongly encourage you to go. You not only hear symphonic music, you hear great vocalists, and you have a lot of fun and you get to sing along with it. There are kids up on stage acting as reindeers at one point. Santa makes an appearance. Um, there weren't fireworks, but there was snow, and I suspect next year there will be fireworks or some sort of pyro. Not in KP. This is oh, at Cordova High's yeah. Performing Arts Center. I suspect there will be uh, indoor pyrotechnics there as well. That just seems like the natural evolution of the event. So they did, uh, they did a wonderful job. We're really proud to have Symphony de Oro Ranch Cordova representing us in the region. Uh, Thanksgiving tree lighting. I thought the fireworks were awesome. Um, I don't know. Cyrus and I both have firsthand experience at setting off fireworks. Very, very close range. So maybe we ought to sign you up for one of those experiences. What, what was yours called, Cyrus? What did they call it this year at the air show? The Wall of Fire. Yes. The Wall of Fire. I remember that. The Wall of Fire. I think, I don't know if they call it. see the Wall of Fire all over town. I do, yeah. You feel it, definitely. I set it off a couple years ago when they were doing a December 7th um, simulation. Yeah. It, was, it was amazing. I've also lit fireworks manually, which is another fun experience. It's a little more impressive than feeling the heat of them. You sort of get pushed by him. But I, our, our Christmas tree lighting is sort of like the concert I just described. You know, there's nothing like that in the region. Um, and it's not just the fireworks. It's everything else that's going on there. It was so well laid out. You see so many community organizations and so many kids volunteering. I mean, dozens of kids volunteering at that event to make it work for, uh, for hundreds of other kids. So I'm very proud of the community council for pulling that together, as well as, uh, I don't know, 20 or 20 or more other community organizations are involved. Thank you, David. Bob. I was trying to think of when I set off the fireworks, but it was on the 4th of July, and we still had fireworks going on in the football field. So it's been a while, but uh, they let me go out there and set off one of them, and it was quite an experience, that's for sure. Um, the tree lighting, yes, definitely that was fantastic. My uh, three-year-old granddaughter, just watched two ladies up there who were singing about music from Frozen. And she knows most of that music, I think. But she had a good time with that. So it was a wonderful uh, event all the way across, I think, with uh, the food, with the kids, and the, all the music and everything that was uh, in the tree lighting. And um, fireworks were great, a little loud, and, but they were great. So we'll see how that goes next year. <laughs> the um, Mather Veterans Village is uh, moving right along, and I'm really glad about that because that means we'll be able to get uh, veterans off the street into the homes and into the uh, uh, transitional part also on the two-story uh, building. So permanent housing and transitional both to get them off the street, and I'm looking forward to that because we've been working on that for years. So I'm glad that it's making the progress that it is. Um, 
Linda reminded me of the 21 candidates that were running for the city council in 2002 when the people voted on becoming a city or not, and there were 21 candidates for the five. One of the 21 candidates was against becoming a city, which was kind of interesting, I thought, but he wasn't elected, so. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, Aubrey Stone last. was one of those, uh, <laughs> but you weren't there. So um, Aubrey Stone was one of the um, candidates who uh -huh. really helped. Number seven. Seven? Six or seven, number seven. Yeah, he was, he was working everything he could to help us become a city. Yeah. And he wanted to be on the city council also, but um, he was great uh, helping us on that. So definitely his name will be on the when we uh, cl close this evening. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I'm not gonna repeat some of the things that have already been done because we have so many wonderful things going on, the music and all the rest. So for the, those who are um, here now and we won't see, uh, I hope you have a wonderful uh, holiday season. Thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, so every, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure there were people here who were at the Christmas tree lighting, and, and it truly, they, um, they really did outdo themselves this year. And then on next door, all the ladies were talking about having frozen fever. And this isn't little girls, this is grown ups who all took their kids, but they all had frozen fever. Um, the Santa train, the uh, live steamers. Um, estimate that they gave rides to 800 people that night. And um, their Santa train was in action this weekend and will be in action again Saturday and Sunday next weekend. And you can come out and ride the train and visit with Santa and enjoy um, candy canes and uh, cookies and chocolate and, and whatnot. Um, the meeting that Garrett's is talking about is our 25-year effort to pass the uh, Habitat Protection Plan, um, which uh, is now in place. And like everything else, it gets a steering committee, and it gets a JPA, and it gets an executive director. And, and um, of course, the, the uh, business community is going to pay for it, all of our landowners who want to develop their land. Um, the broadband conference was quite fascinating. And the broadband conference came at a really good time because in addition to um, in addition to people in the rural areas wanting to bring this subject to the forefront, the um, Department of Agriculture, USDA, is very much involved in trying to extend broadband into our rural areas. And um, the day before the conference, I had been to Paradise, um, which was really quite fascinating. It was um, it was eye opening. Uh, it was uh, moving. Um, I was up there for the meeting of the Secretary of the Interior and the Secretary of Agriculture, and um, there are lessons to be learned in terms of access, uh, as in public works. Um, I know our SEPTED expert is in the back of the room, and I pointed out to him that there are um, there's some things about that fire that were completely unpredictable, and the quixotic nature and the way in which it jumped things was, uh, was um, scary and powerful. Um, the, um, the big church where we met, uh, the, 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 the road that I used to get into Paradise, Clark Road, which is Highway 191, uh, is also um, one of the main commercial corridors. And the, um, the Safeway Shopping Center is Complete, completely burned out shells. Um, the McDonald's is gone, the KFC is gone, but then in the next block, the US Post Office is intact. And then in the next block, the, um, the big church where the meeting was held is intact. But here again, the, um, the landscaping in front of the church is all, is all burned and it burned up to this giant conifer right in the front door of the church and didn't touch the church. So um, one of the neighborhoods that the uh, Sacramento Bee wrote about, one of the stories was a guy who rescued his family from a neighborhood called Camelot, which is a little bit south of town on, on Highway 191. And uh, as driving out of uh, uh, Paradise, everything on the west side is perfectly intact. Summertime or late fall brown hills, um, on the on the 
east, east side of the road, it's all burned up to the edge of the road. It went down the road a couple of miles in about a 50 foot stretch, jumped the road and went over and burned up homes in paradise. It just, there's absolutely no rhyme or reason to it. There's intact buildings next door to destroyed buildings. Um, but I think the biggest lesson probably uh, is, is the access and the fact that our public works um, uh, professionals have always had um, goals for how many ingress, how much ingress and egress we have into our neighborhood based on the, the size of the neighborhood and the number of homes and the, and the population. And it's really important that we continue that commitment to that kind of thing. Um, the broadband is important because, as we found out in, in the floods in 86 and 95 and 97, our um, cell phones don't work in, a, in an environment like that. Number one, the, um, all the power lines were down all along both sides of the road. So if you even do have, if you even do have power to the cell towers, then emergency services are using up the, cell, the cells, available cell capacity. And so just the average person can't really communicate. So there has to be a way in which we um, figure out how to communicate with people in these rural areas when we have situations like that. Um, it was a week of contrasts, and so we did, the Big Wheels was a wonderful event. Uh, we got to roast uh, former mayor of uh, Folsom, Bob Holderness. And David, well, I'm well sorry. Well-deserved. Well-deserved, and, and, uh, and I have to say, um, you didn't get a big wheel because they gave Bob the steering wheel. They gave him a small wheel uh, because he really is the person who came up with the idea of doing the TMA uh, in the first place. The two concerts were phenomenal. Um, the one at the Performing Arts Center, uh, it was a little disconcerting to get snowed on in, inside, but um, <laughs> we did. Fortunately, it uh, sort of dried up. It didn't just stick around and melt. Um, and uh, then yesterday afternoon, another one of those uniquely Rancho Cordova events, the concert at Coriana by the River City Band. And um, the band, you would never know those people are volunteers. They, are, they have become so professional in the three or four years that we've had, that we've been entertained by them. Um, it is, it is, uh, it is worth every drop. The room was packed. Um, people came and went constantly. BJ has actually bought special sort of desk chairs so that people can actually sit there and eat and have a place to put their, um, put their food while they're listening to the concert. Um, last year, I had one of the guys from downtown from the city of Sacramento's um, cultural department uh, come and talk to our leadership class, and he couldn't get over the fact that we have concerts in a grocery store in Rancho Cordova. And I said, sweetie, it's because you don't live in Rancho Cordova. You too can be a part of our concerts in grocery stores. So um, yes, um, in, ter in terms of adjourning tonight's meeting, we do want to recognize long-term uh, Rancho Cordova resident Aubrey Stone. We've, we did not know him uh, when he signed up to run for city council. We, um, I think the majority of us didn't realize he's, he's uh, um, just in the neighborhood in front of yours. Yeah, sort of a neighbor of mine. And um, uh, we really didn't know the man and found him an absolute delight and a wonderful gentleman, uh, retired Air Force. And, um, um, and not only was he head of the uh, uh, California Black Chamber, but he also ran a radio station, which was one of the few uh, black-owned radio stations only. Okay, I know that a couple of elections ago, um, I went over and got interviewed on his radio station. Um, and then the other person that we've lost this week is Jerry Drobish. Oh. And Jerry is the person, it's in the grapevine. Jerry is the person who started the farmhouse preschool back 30 years ago. He also was retired Air Force, and there's a really nice um, article in the grapevine where he talked to um, 
talk to Paul just about his recollections of being a pilot and, and whatnot. But um, quite frankly, 30, 30 years ago, Jerry Drobish and I were really officially the, the only two Rancho Cordova residents who truly supported the light rail. Um, and the and then on the other on the flip side, the odd thing was light rail was opposed by the Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce and the Carmichael Chamber of Commerce because they were devoted to building a bridge across the river. And they didn't think it ought to be, they didn't think any money should be spent on light rail. Um, but Jerry located his farmhouse preschool. He got uh, old barracks from Mather that were being um, uh, relocated. And he located his farmhouse preschool across the street from Butterfield because he knew that parents, this was even before franchise tax was um, envisioned, he knew that parents could drop their kids at preschool and then go get on the train and go to work. And it was out there for um, a good 20 years. And at some point in the early 2000s, he sold the property to, he retired and sold the property to, um, uh, I think the Korean church, and they used it for a while and then built a big sanctuary and then Metro Fire did a um, uh, live fire exercise uh, on the, the original building sometime this summer. Um, but Jerry was a very creative person who had all sorts of uh, ideas and um, um, participated in transportation issues. He participated in all sorts of things here at the city, and um, he will be sorely missed. So we'll um, adjourn tonight's memory in their honor, as well as uh, recall um, our late president, George H.W. Bush. Cyrus. And Madam Mayor, I think you neglected to point out that you had a role as a conductor. I did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I you did, actually, actually and, and I did want to, I did want to say, um, uh, thank you, because you do remind me. Um, uh, Feliz Navidad. Yeah, they. I got to conduct Feliz Navidad. But um, they did a, such a variety of music yesterday at Coriana that you absolutely can't believe it. Uh, they they closed with a, a, the little popular selections. But at the beginning, um, they did a very um, well-known old uh, English carols, and um, and then they did a wonderful tribute to Hanukkah, which of course starts today. Um, and then they did this fantastic performance of the five basic themes from the Messiah. And it just, they were incredible. They were really absolutely incredible. And this was the band, this was not the concert orchestra, but this was the band. Yeah, my mother-in-law actually uh, contacted me earlier today and said that when you know I become mayor and if they're still doing that, she was reserving in advance my right to conduct for herself. <laughs> 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 Apparently, it's a lifelong ambition of hers. So we might have well, to arrange good. that. I, I, I'll tell you, they gave me they gave me a souvenir baton. I will lend it to Donna, and she can use it. <laughs> Cyrus. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to give, give an update on the results of uh, our election. I, we had planned to certify the results tonight, but we received the official results from the county right after the council agenda was out on Friday evening. So, so we will do that officially at the next meeting, and that's the reason that it is not on the agenda tonight. Um, along with the uh, selection and appointment of uh, the new mayor and vice mayor, all that will happen at the uh, uh, second meeting in December uh, this month. And uh, another quick update, just wanted to, um, we had a visit from a group of uh, uh, Brigham Young University students who visited, uh, these are some MPA students that would like to learn about the local government. They. Uh, came to the city, visited with our leadership team, and we had a great meeting and uh, a great discussion to just uh, um, understand what are some of the hard issues for the young generation and the students in, in, uh, at this time. And lastly, I, um, the mayor has visited, has visited city of Parad town of Paradise. 
uh, I, along with a group of my colleagues, plan on uh, going traveling to Paradise on December 14th. The purpose of the visit is twofold. One is to um, see if there's any way that we could uh, lend in, uh, to them in the way of uh, expertise or time and resources, uh, because they are going through such a tremendous, uh, tremendous recovery effort at this point. And also, um, another one is to learn lessons. You know, what, what are some of the things that we can learn from that community in dealing with uh, any potential tragedies or events that could uh, face other communities? So that's, that's planned, and I will report back on the lessons that we have learned. That's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Cyrus. So we move into our consent calendar. Consent calendar items are deemed routine uh, and can be approved with one motion unless somebody wishes to pull an item. Do we have anybody signed up to speak for a comment? We do not. Okay. So does anybody need to discuss an item? Seeing none, I'll move the calendar. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Stacy, will you call the roll, please? Council Member Terry? Aye. Council Member Sander? Aye. Council Member Gatewood? Aye. Vice Mayor McGarvey? Aye. Mayor Budge? Yes, thank you very much. I would just like to point out, too, that $4.15 million went to Rancho Cordova firms out of these contracts. So I just want to thank the city for doing a lot more outreach in the region and pulling in Rancho firms. Thank you. Okay, 14.1. The title of 14.1 is a resolution declaring a protest hearing and authorizing the mailing of a property owner ballot relating to the imposition of an annual stormwater utility fee for the Sunridge Village project. So do you want to um, announce the... I have, um, I have not received any written protests and to my knowledge there are no okay. speakers here. Is there anybody in the audience tonight who came to speak to this item? Okay, seeing, uh, I should probably open the public hearing. Okay, I'll open the public hearing and ask again if there's anybody who came to speak to this item. And I don't see anybody jumping up. So we'll close the public hearing and turn it back to Stacy. I have nothing further to say. Great, then <laughs> uh, you're going to mail out the ballot. Oh, I think Elizabeth. Elizabeth is going to mail the ballot. Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful, thank you very much. Item 15.1. Do we need to do a roll call? Don't we need a motion? Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I'll That's move okay. the item. No, you're right, thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay, motion in a second. Thank you. Roll call, um, Council Member Gatewood? Aye. Council Member Terry? Aye. Council Member Sander? Aye. Vice Mayor McGarvey? Aye. Mayor Budge? <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Motion carries. You said it would be short, Elizabeth, so I was just trying to make it really short. Okay. Um, item 15.1. 15.1, the title is a resolution authorizing the city to participate in the bond opportunities for land development bold program and establishing guidelines for the use of alternative land secured financing programs. Kim. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, Kim Duran, Cara Giorgio, Administrative Services Director, and I'm joined tonight by Mich with Michelle Mingay, our Senior Finance Analyst. And we are here this evening to ask that the City Council authorize a resolution that would enable the city to participate in the Bond Opportunities for Land Development Program, also referred to as BOLD. BOLD is another means for this Rancho Cordova development community to finance infrastructure, public facilities, and development fees through a pooled bond issuance handled by the California Municipal Finance Authority. Pooled financing programs such as BOLD are ideal for project financing of less than $5 million since they provide efficiencies and cost savings that make smaller financing cost effective. The city currently participates in another pooled financing program, the Statewide Community Infrastructure Program, referred to as SKIP, which is similar to BOLD. The two programs differ in that SKIP imposes an assessment lien as determined by an engineer's report, whereas BOLD issues a special tax via the formation of a community facilities district, or a CFD, 
which is the most common financing mechanism that for new development in the city of Rancho Cordova. Once approved by the city council, Bold would require little involvement from the city council. The CMFA and its consultant team will form and approve each CFD. The Bold finance team is the same team that the city currently works with on its own financings and includes Jones Hall for Bond Council, Goodwin Consulting Group for Special Tax Services, and Piper Jaffrey as underwriter. Ongoing administration of the BOLD program and all required annual disclosures to bond investors will be handled by CMFA in consultation with developers. In addition to the requested approval of BOLD, staff is asking that the City Council also approve the recommended guidelines for use of alternative land secured financing programs. These recommended guidelines are intended to provide a framework for how the city will work with developers to determine the most efficient manner in which to finance public infrastructure and or development impact fees. I'll take a brief moment to walk through what was included as attachment to to the staff report, which highlights what those um, policies recommendations are. The first of which is that the city would generally recommend the use of an alternative land secured financing program such as skip or bold for financings below $5 million. Financings in excess of $5 million would continue to be done by the city through a CFD. A sizing model must be completed for any land secured financing request and must not result in a total effective tax rate in excess of 1.75% of current market value, including all special taxes. In addition, in accordance with the city's debt policy, all bond issuances shall have at least a four to one property value rate to public lien ratio. The SKIP program, one of the uh, land secured financing programs, can only be used to finance the city's transportation impact fee and cannot be used to finance public infrastructure. The BOLD program, which is proposed before you this evening, can be used to finance both public infrastructure and development impact fees, but cannot include pay-as-you-go financing. And finally, any development impact fees funded through the issuance of these bonds must have an active CIP program, which guarantees that the monies collected will be spent within the three-year window. And the, in no term can uh, bonds issued by either program exceed 30 years. So those are the recommended guidelines that we are proposing to follow. This would make it easier for our um, colleagues in the development industry to understand how we're going to view their requests and make it consistent across the board. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for staff. Okay, we don't have any. Did anybody else come to speak to this item? Okay. Come on, the infrastructure financing doesn't get everybody excited. <laughs> we can finance a lot of roads with this, Mita. <laughs> Elizabeth can't re, can't repave though. <laughs> okay, so um, are we ready for a motion? I'll move the item. Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Council Member Gatewood. Aye. Council Member Terry. Aye. Council Member Sander. Aye. Vice Mayor McGarvey. Aye. Mayor Aye. Budge. Yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, <coughs> so we're on to item sixteen point one, which is an update on crime statistics from the Rancho Cordova Police Department. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Uh, tonight we're gonna be talking about the uniform crime reporting for Rancho Cordova for the years 2017 back to 2013. And uh, also we'll be talking about a little bit of crime statistics. So this is just the agenda that we'll go through, um, but please feel free to jump in whenever you have some questions. I'll try to keep it at a high overview, but uh, feel free to stop me at any time, and then at the end we will have a separate section for questions. Um, we're gonna talk about the update on the citywide crime data, like I said, between 2013 to 2017. Uh, we're gonna then break out, talk about violent crime data and property crime, how population changes affects that, and then a crime rate based on population change, and then wrapping it up with comparison to other jurisdictions. So if you recall last year, we came to you with our first uh, UCR update as me as chief of police. 
Um, we went back and used all the known data that we had that was accurate, which was back down to 2011. So that period was 2011 to 2016. Um, this year, we're going to start standardizing on a five-year trend window, which is uh, industry standard to look at for crime trends. Um, so this, this one will be a little bit different. It'll be on a five-year, and then we'll be using that going forward. So if you don't know what uniform crime reporting is, it's actually a, a standard set forth by the FBI that most agencies in the United States actually report crime data uh, in a standardized way. So it's broken down into two types of crimes, violent crime or categories, violent crime categories and property crime categories. Um, it's based on reported actual reports that have been reported to the police department. And just to put it in perspective, in 2017, uh, we had 42,000 citizen-generated calls for service. And out of that, there were 6,000 total crime reports taken. And the part one crime that we're going to be talking about this evening were 29% of those uh, reported crimes. So this is the crime trends for 2013 to 2017. Um, if you look at the chart, uh, back in 2013, we had uh, 352 reported crimes that were part of the violent crime uh, category, which is made up of homicide, sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault. If you look at the trend, which is a better way to gauge versus looking from year to year with small changes, uh, you look at the actual overall trend, you'll see we are trending downward. We do have a, a tick upward this year in the violent crime category, but the um, number of crimes in this category is so small that small changes make major differences to the actual um, percentages. So to break it down more specifically, um, homicide remained unchanged, sexual assaults remained unchanged. Uh, we did notice an uptick in robbery. We had uh, 11 additional robberies in 2017, then we did 2016, and we had, um, excuse me, 49 additional um, aggravated assaults from 2017 uh, from 2016. Total crime was, uh, 60 additional total crime for violent crime for years 2016 from 20 or 2017 from 2016. So most of that change was all in the obviously all the change was all for robbery and assault. The there were 11 more robberies that were mostly all related to um, commercial robberies. For example, we had at least four additional robberies of one of the big box stores in town that was basically a shoplifting that there was forced use, so it changes it into a robbery. But like I said earlier, smaller adjustments make big changes in the percentages. As far as the assault, aggravated assaults, a majority of those were increasing, an increase in domestic violence. Uh, assault was a deadly weapon with not a firearm, so like a baseball bat or a knife or something else that would have caused great bodily injury, and an increase in firearm-related crimes. So breaking into property crimes, uh, they're basically the burglaries, the larcenies, and motor vehicle theft. Uh, we did have a trend down uh, decrease over the last five years, which is a 35% decrease in crime. Um, if you notice, there is a dotted line on there, and that is, as we previously talked about, and I'll get into more in a few minutes, of uh, we did find an accounting error on how we're reporting our stolen vehicles, and so I'll talk about more detail on that, but if those were reported correctly in the last two years, we would have showed a further decrease in the property crimes over the last two years. So specifically, burglaries are down, larcenies are down, motor vehicle thefts per the report were up, arsons were down, and overall were down in total property crimes. Um, as I indicated earlier, there was an accounting area that we found as we were looking at the statistics. Uh, we noticed that um, the motor vehicle thefts were not being reported properly by the, it's a manual process that's being done and it's done on paper. And when we report um, UCR stats to the state, it's based on the month that is actually reported, not on when the crime occurs. So these were, since it was a manual process, we found up to a six month backlog in reports, which caused several of the reports to be reported in the wrong year. If these numbers were shown accurately, we actually would have shown a decrease in motor vehicle theft from 2016 to 2017. The 2016 number should have read actually 182, and the 2017 number should have read 131. So overall, we would have shown a, a larger decrease in property crimes. 
um, it would have shown a 13% reduction from 26 to 2017. Uh, that has been fixed. We are now doing it all in-house at RCPD and reporting them manually. And we have a new records management system that should be online early next year that will automate the process. But for now, we are up to date. So that two-year window where this snafu happened, that won't happen in the future. Uh, together, total crimes for the year, we are slightly trending upward. With We don't take into account the motor vehicle uh, theft reporting issue. We were 2% up for 2016 and 2017, but overall we're 32.8% down over the five-year trend window. Taking into adjustment the um, adjustment for the motor vehicle theft um, misreporting, we would actually be at a 2.5% reduction uh, from 2016 to 2017. Uh, as we talked last year, population is very important to look at. Um, that's not a status quo number with a growing city like ours. We have the 9% um, uh, population growth occurring here in the five-year window, so it will affect the crime trends as we have to factor that number in. Best practices is to base um, your crime stats on a per 1,000 individual. So when we recalculate the numbers, it actually shows that we're going to have a larger decrease of or a larger um, crime decrease over the five-year period. We did switch the way we are factoring uh, the population changes. Last year, we used the Department of Finance numbers. Um, this year, we're actually using the FBI estimate numbers, which is part of the UCR reporting to keep it consistent. So the numbers you see here will be the ones that are reported by the FBI, and all jurisdictions would have access to them. Uh, the numbers are pretty consistent to what the Department of Finance is just on timing. It may be a little bit off within a couple hundred here or there, but the numbers are pretty consistent. And as you can see, we've had a 9% growth. So when taking population into consideration, uh, over the last five-year period, we actually showed a 38.3% drop in crime, uh, which is actually higher than last year's 31.5%, but that is mostly because of uh, 2013, we had a very high year of crime, and since then, we've been slowly going down in the crime rate. Um, crime is pretty much taken into consideration population is pretty status quo, pretty flat this year as it was last year. If we do the adjustments for uh, readjusting the numbers for the accurate stolen vehicle reporting, we'd actually show a decrease in crime of 41.7% uh, over the last five years, and crime would be down to 22 crimes per 1,000, where without the, with the numbers as reported, they were 23.3 crimes per 1,000. Uh, taking a little look forward, we are have, we do have uh, two three quarters of 2018 crime stats already done. Uh, we do show a further decrease of 8.4 percent decrease in violent crimes for this year of 2018, and a 1.2 percent decrease of property crimes, and with an overall 2.5 decrease reported Part One crimes uh, in the third quarter of 2018. So, if the trend stands, we should be also looking at another downward trend for next year. And this is our comparison chart that shows us where we are compared in the region with the other law enforcement agencies and cities. So as it was last year, we are showing we are Rancho Cordova is the largest, we experienced the largest decrease in any jurisdiction over the last five year period. Um, again, the number is not adjusted for the stolen vehicle. These are actually the numbers reported to the FBI. If we did adjust the numbers, that last number that would be 23.3 would actually be a 20.0 or 22.0, I'm sorry. As you can see, uh, we are uh, underneath Sacramento, we're underneath Citrus Heights, and um, we sit right above uh, the unincorporated areas of Sacramento. And that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Or would like to get into more detail on any of this? Donald? Go first. I was just going to thank you. Uh, um, since you started doing it in this format, it's been um, a lot more helpful for me, at least visualizing it. Um, I think in years past, I would I would make the mistake of, I think, overanalyzing these and thinking that just because numbers go down or they go up, that you make the conclusion that you know more crimes reported or more crimes happening could be a good or a bad thing, depending on you know if people are just giving up on reporting them because nobody's responding. Right? That doesn't mean we got safer, right? So, um, but it, it's always eye-opening to, to, to look at the trends and see where they're going, but great job, thank you. Thank you.
I agree. Uh, always excellent. So I'm going to go through a couple things, and you tell me what uh, what we're thinking about. Okay. Um, uh, right now, a lot of the business owners are feeling the pinch um, due to the homeless, the vagrants that are running into the different business, especially near like Fight Circle and that area. Do we have a strategy to protect the business owners? Because they're um, they're running into a lot more people breaking into their overall spaces, uh, people camp camping out. Um, do we have? They're feeling a, a lot more pressure than they did had in the past. And uh, what do you, what, do we have a strategy to kind of combat that? We do, and specifically to fight circle, we've actually met with them and went out there and talked to their the building owners and discussed several strategies that we can help them with and and give them guidance on septed principles to change like the the design of the area. Uh, we've also deployed. Um, uh, civilian CSO officers, volunteers to be high profile in those areas, patrol officers to be high profile in those areas. So we do have a pretty decent strategy that has been proven to work in two separate areas of the city so far that has dealt with some of those, those lower level crimes like vandalism, things like that. Um, but yes, we do have a very good strategy to work that. And if you have something specific that you want me to meet with, uh, Tina Aldama, who we, you met last time, um, she's definitely our point person on that. Okay. Chris, we've all used the term septed. Please define it. Crime prevention through environmental design. Yeah. So that's when we take out the bushes and put the lights up. And yes. Play, and play the orchestra music just to make sure that the people can get to hear it all night long. That's part of it. But we actually, with Rancho Cordova Police Department, we have a pretty comprehensive solution to dealing with the issues that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's been proven to work in two different areas here where we've had some major crime areas. And uh, we deployed the, this this process into it, working with the building landlords and the owners. And uh, it's been very successful. Okay. Excellent. Um, have you? Uh, how do you feel the overall security of the business, uh, different business regions are going in Rancho Cordova right now? Could when it comes to more like crime the, uh, in that in those areas, like near the targets and Safeways and stuff like that, how are you seeing that overall crime statistic in those areas? Are they going down? Are they starting to trend better? What do you see? The area of the Foz is still one of the hot spots for for Rancho Cordova. Uh, we've actually just deployed a new intelligence-led policing project to focus specifically on that area, and we're basically bringing all of our resources to bear to try to adjust those crime stats. Um, they're still fairly low. I mean, it's not really high, but when it, you look at the city overall, it stands out, and right. so it is an area we're going to be focusing on. Um, the crime we see is a lot of shoplifting, um, a lot of trespassing, things like that, not necessarily violent crime, um, so it's more of the, the lower-end type stuff but it does affect quality of life. So those are the issues we're trying to focus on. So currently our day shift watch commander is spearheading that project and we're just getting it kicked off. We just started about a week ago. So he's putting plans together and to really focus on that whole area to try to make a dent in those numbers. All right. Um, last thing, uh, I know we were, there were some issues and we released early release in July of 2017 and I saw our numbers spike with violent crimes and it looks like it's a trend. Um, is there a reason that you know of why it would do that? I, I mean, as Donald said, numbers can mean that more people are reporting it and stuff like that. But do you, is it due to that or is it due to some other issue that you know of that why we spike, it seems to spike another 40 or 50 violent crimes? Like it almost goes in a trend of up and down and up and down. Yeah, I, I noticed the trend up and down, and we dissected the data the best we could. And I, as I said, I have the specifics for actually this last year for 2017 and 2016, the difference. And what we noticed almost entirely, it was the, there was 11 additional robberies. And again, nine of those were to, to businesses. So they're commercial robberies. Um, so out of that, most of those were actually shoplifting that involved violence. So somebody didn't want to just give up. They actually fought the security. That would have turned it into a robbery versus a shoplift. So we're seeing the difference there with those numbers. And also with aggravated assaults, as I said before, um, we saw quite a big increase, actually. The numbers are small, so the percentage increase looks big, but they're, they're small numbers in the scheme of things. But there was 49 additional aggravated assaults, which there's 35 different crimes that make up an aggravated assault, uh, that category. But the biggest increases that we saw were domestic violence. Uh, we did see an increase there. 
Um, we saw the assault with a deadly weapon that was not a firearm. We saw an 11% increase in those. And so that would have been like a baseball bat or a knife or something like that. And then firearm related charges, we actually saw a, a 13 additional from 2016. It was 30 in 2016, 43 in 2017. And so those would be assault with deadly weapon with a firearm or some other crime with a firearm involved. Those made up the biggest uh, difference in, in that category. Um, we did notice early on, we had some gang issue pop back in uh, into Rancho Cordova. Some young, young gang members uh, were starting to, to do business here and uh, we immediately re-strategized and deployed our resources out and that has been dealt with. Okay, that's what I was thinking. When you said that, I was like a gang tried to come back in yeah. to, into town. That's usually what that involves. Okay, yeah. uh, you know what? These numbers are excellent. Uh, Don and I were remarking that we'd love to see this, you know, maybe once a month. It's our biggest budget item, and it's the thing that most of my constituents and business owners ask the most about. So thank you for your time. Oh, absolutely. Can I clarify that? I, I appreciate the crime statistics, but I'd also like to spend just more time talking about initiatives. What What is the crime suppression unit working on? What are your successes and focuses and those types of things um, and practices and explain some things? I know I talked to you a while back about um, uh, the length of time in officer-involved shootings before reports and things like that come out in the length. And um, you really helped me understand that. But I think all of us have a lot to learn about what we're spending our money on in the police department that you guys are. So I, I would just like to be up, not just updated on statistics, but just have an opportunity to have workshops to talk about this stuff so that I better understand what we're doing. And we have been putting plans in motion just to do exactly that, that so we can talk a lot more frequently versus several big times each year. Sure. And um, believe it or not, crime suppression unit does uh, really fall right in line with these crime stats. Um, just to let you know, uh, they we use a program intelligence led policing where we look at this data on a weekly basis and we try to determine what's causing the crime to go up or down or what's affecting different trends in our region what crimes we're seeing out there and so the csu team is instrumental in being a reactionary arm that when we see a trend they'll roll out, roll out and be very proactive into trying to stop that trend from continuing. And uh, hence the gang issue that we saw, we caught that very early on. Uh, they went out there and, and dealt with it and they are not alone. They bring in patrol and all these other resources, pop everybody else. But um, CSU is very instrumental in, in making these crime stats the way they are. Thank you. Thank you. And also along those lines, this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the fourth time this year that we've been talking about public safety and inf issues related to that. Yeah, and and you know, Garrett, you, you've started about a year and a half ago, but normally we would talk about police when the contract was about to come up. <laughs> and that was pretty much, or maybe we'd get this report once a year and then we would, it's 18 months until the contract's up, what do we wanna do? Those were the workshops that we had the first few years here. So I do appreciate the, the, the more timely um, reflections this year. And, and I do believe Assistant Chief Sheldorf should be ready soon with a report back on red light cameras too. So that'll probably be our next presentation to go into very detailed information for council to see. Okay, David. Well, colleagues, I would also encourage you to take advantage of the uh, ride along opportunities that are offered by the uh, police department. Those can be quite informative. Uh, riding along with a sergeant or, or a junior officer uh, or a special unit, whatever the case may be. I found those to be incredibly uh, educational over the years. You can also attend their briefings, particularly uh, intelligence-led policing briefing is, is pretty interesting to see how they're actually working with all the data that's coming into the police department from various sources, including us and our residents, about uh, priorities we have in neighborhoods, seeing how they deal with that on an ongoing basis in a briefing, that's, that's pretty helpful. I would also encourage you to call and text the chief. He is, uh, he is very responsive. <laughs> I think uh, he and I are probably in touch on nearly a daily basis. Uh, on average, certainly probably every other day on, on one issue mm -hmm. or another. And uh, I was reluctant to, to engage with uh, him quite at that level, but he has encouraged me every step of the way, saying every bit of you know, communication I'm giving him is basically feeding into that intelligence-led policing model. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, it's gratifying for me to see responses to things that I see or my family see or my friends see uh, as we go about business here in Rancho Cordova. And so I'm always encouraging our residents, you know, if you see it, call about it. If you have any doubt whatsoever, if something doesn't look right, call about it. Mm -hmm. uh, 911 is there for that purpose. So many of our residents will say, well, 
you know, it just it didn't seem like it was really 911, like 911 should be reserved for when uh, Godzilla shows up, you know. <laughs> That's not what 911 is reserved for. 911 is for a ton of stuff. Uh, let the 911 operator sort it out. You know what? How this how this ought to be handled. Let the officers on duty sort out how it's handled. It's not left to the judgment of our residents. Just call. If you see something unusual you don't like, call. Um, and that certainly applies as well to code enforcement, public works, anything else in the city. Because our officers, unfortunately, and we and our staff cannot be everywhere, see everything, respond to everything. But our citizens can. By definition, they're there, where they're living, going about what they're doing in our community. They're the, they're the eyes of the city of Rancho Cordova. We just need them to be connected to the rest of us. So uh, Chief, anytime you get a, you know, an opportunity to send that message, I hope you're sending sort of the same one, which is, if in doubt of any kind, call. I absolutely do, and thank you, Councilman Sander. I, I would like to comment on that same topic is that was one of the ideas behind neighborhood policing, to have that connection that you and I share with the entire city. So people know they can call their officer, they can call one of us to report something that's going on that may not be necessarily a crime in progress, but it's an issue that they see in their neighborhood. Those are the type of things that don't necessarily show up through intelligence-led policing or crime stats, but they're things that affect people's lives. And those are the, that's how we have to have these relationships formed so we can actually get that information. So yeah, ride along to briefings, use your mobile device safely for its best purpose. Um, the crime stats are unbelievable. I mean, to be down 37, or if you, they were correctly reported back when, it would have been 41% yeah. um, in this time yeah. period. That's an unbelievable change. And you just have to sort of look at that graph and you can see that's a remarkable uh, adjustment that has occurred there. Um, I think we've got a lot to be proud of. We still have some stuff to work on, but it's gonna get harder, frankly, to drive it down a lot more uh, yep. given where we are. We're getting, we're getting to you know fewer and fewer crimes per capita. Um, working that down will, will be a challenge, but that's a good challenge to have. And we have a very creative chief right now, a very creative force, doing a lot of very unique things, uh, I think, in our region with regard to policing. So we've got a lot to be proud of, and I certainly hope we talk about uh, the success we've had. Because all too often in the past, as Donald mentioned, we don't talk about this all that often. And we generally haven't bragged about our past successes, although this, this trend line extends back. Um, this is the latest segment of a, of a period of success for us in public safety. And as we, uh, you know, as our community goal number one is improve image, this is the thing that has dragged us down over the years. We've been inappropriately labeled. Um, and this is the data basically refuting that opinion. So this is something we should all be very proud of and talk about a lot. But thank you for your good work. Thank you. Absolutely. Bob. Uh, one thing, the um, using the uh, Measure H um, comprehensive uh, uh, community, uh, our new That's CSU, <laughs> oh, yes. command abbreviations, sorry about that. Um, that was the money that we got from Measure H money. And that's uh, another good way of using the uh, um, citizens' uh, money. I and mean, when we started in 2015, we said, what do you want to spend your tax money on? And that's one of the things that was one of the first things is safety in the police. And we've been doing that. I use, I, I shop at uh, Walmart quite often. And just looking at the difference now in what it was. And how much of a uh, difference is, do you have a new store manager there? Or relatively new or? Uh, no, he's the same store manager we had for a little while now. Okay. Because it's, it's, when you go there to the store, there's no one out there on the tables or trying to get anything except someone trying to get a signature for a petition. But that's a different story rather than having people out there trying to get money, trying to get that. And you also don't see that many in the parking lot either. I haven't seen any for a while. I'm sure they're there. But you don't have anything that you park and the first thing you do when you open the door is somebody going like this. That's not there. And that's a tremendous difference on the... Uh, uh, Walmart. Now, granted, we've got some people that come in from downtown, wherever, and get off at the, at the uh, light rail, come across, and do some uh, um, burglary, or uh, you know. And it's, it frustrates me when you have um, a felony is now over nine hundred and fifty dollars or something yes. like that. that. Yes. Anything less than that is not. <laughs> that's completely ridiculous because you can 
spell, you know, sell something that much and then be back on the streets again the next day or the same day. And that's, I wish there was something that could be done with uh, legislation that would change that back to at least a smaller amount before you start getting uh, be a felony. Because the stores, uh, people don't think about it, but they sure do uh, make a difference. Their profit margin drops very quickly when you start having some kids in there and just a few toys. That doesn't mean much. Well, it does. So thank you for um, working with the stores and the managers and like that, because I think it's, that's what's making the big difference on that also. Thank you very much. And we do have a very good relationship with Walmart. Uh, we work that area quite frequently. Um, also, the, some of the notices that you've seen out there has been a direct reflection of CSU and our hot team, actually. So a lot of those those issues were being caused by homeless or transients in this area. And the hot team going out and doing that outreach that we've been doing has made a huge difference for that that specific area. Good. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, really, it's... Uh Obviously, the picture is that you're approaching it on several different fronts, and, and that's what's really making the difference. Did anybody else want to speak to this item tonight? Okay, then we want to thank you. And um, um, so all of this information is on probably on your website and on our website now. And um, we are at the end of the meeting. Do we have any future agenda items that anybody wants to put on the agenda, gentlemen? Okay. Then we're going to adjourn this meeting tonight um, in memory of Aubrey Stone and Jerry Drobish and uh, in honor of our late president, George H.W. Bush. Thank you all very much. Good night. <laughs>